Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this webinar, Core Concepts of Addiction. This webinar forms part of the Rural Health West 2020 virtual conference. Before I hand you over to your presenter, I'd like to run through some brief housekeeping. If your audio is not coming through too clearly, you may prefer to switch to audio via your phone. These numbers will be listed on your dashboard. Remember to enter the pin number two. Everybody has been placed on mute to minimize background noise, but we would still love to hear from you. Please enter any questions into the question box, which you can see on your dashboard. The presenter may choose to answer these straight away or save them for the end of the session. This session will be recorded and uploaded to the Rural Health West website under the virtual conference banner. I will now hand you over to your presenter, Paul DeSauer. Hi, everybody. I'd just like to start by acknowledging country. I'm uh, speaking to you all from my home in Fremantle. So I'm in Wajuk Noongar Butcher. I'm in the country of the Wajuk Nation of the Noongar people. And I would just like to acknowledge them and also all the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia, the traditional custodians of these lands. And I would like to pay my respect to them and their culture and to elders past and present and to the emerging generation as well. I'm uh, here today representing Peer-Based Harm Reduction WA. We're a non-government, um, not-for-profit health organisation. And um, I'll just tell you a little bit about who we are. We're a peer-based um, drug and alcohol agency. And uh, what that means is we recruit people who are um, who have life experience of using drugs. Harm Reduction WA was originally called the West Australian Substance Users Association, WASWA, and uh, was originally formed by people who use drugs and who were identifying uh, gaps in services and unmet needs. This gives a unique level of engagement with our consumers. And um, one of our roles, I guess, is to advocate on behalf of people who use drugs. And um, when I say advocate on behalf of, what I mean is um, participate in committees and strategic planning groups, facilitate research, uh, provide a voice to people whose voice is not normally heard by policy users, uh, policy makers, sorry. I've been told having a peer-based drug and alcohol agency is a bit like letting the inmates run the asylum. I'd prefer, well, I'm hoping I can convince you it's a, a bit more like letting women be involved in the Office of Women's Affairs or uh, letting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have input into Indigenous policy in this country. If we're going to develop policies, if we're going to draft legislation, if we're going to set up services or projects, that are meant to engage with and affect the behaviour of, um, the health behaviour of a, uh, a population. Uh, we need some way of talking with those people. Uh, what we need to do is find out what we're doing that works and what we should be doing more of. Um, we need to find out where gaps are and whether there's things we could be doing that we're not. We also need to find out whether anything we're doing is actively counterproductive because sometimes we do things with the best of intentions that make everything worse. Um, as you might imagine, people who use illegal drugs are, are not usually in a position to stand up and advocate on their own behalf. So part of our role is, is taking the information that we get from our consumers and feeding it up, um, feeding it up to policy makers, to, to government and, and so on. But that's not our primary role. We are primarily a, um, a service delivery organisation. Most of our funding comes from the Bloodborne Virus Prevention Sexual Health um, Branch of the uh, State Health Department. And so a lot of our, a lot of our projects are centred around injecting drug use. Everything we do is free to the consumer. Um, everything we do is user friendly. Everything we do is confidential. So the only circumstances under which I would breach a consumer's 
confidentiality is if I assess there's a serious risk of harm to that person or someone else uh, if I don't breach their confidentiality. Um, the other circumstance under which we might breach someone's confidentiality is if we are subpoenaed. F2 is non-judgmental and respectful and that's one of the advantages of using peer workers wherever we can. Everything we do is evidence-based and uh, we do have a reputation for being responsive to emerging trends and that often arises out of our unique level of uh, engagement with our consumers, with, with the people that we work with. We often detect emerging trends or um, notice changes in, in drug availability or purity or drug using behaviour um, early in the piece. And a lot of the projects that we run were actually set up bottom up, not top down. And what I mean by that is they weren't set up because um, a bureaucrat decided that we needed to invest in a certain area. They were set up because our consumers identified that there were problems in, in the community or that there were areas that weren't being addressed. We run a bunch of services, um, primarily needle and syringe exchange programs, NSEP. Uh, we run the largest needle and syringe exchange programs in the state. Uh, we provide more than 2 million pieces of injecting equipment every year. That's more than a third of all the needles and syringes distributed in Western Australia. And we do this through fixed site needle exchanges in Perth and Bunbury. In the southwest region, we have a van that takes um, needle exchange out to several country towns. We have a mail order and postal service so that people anywhere in the state of Western Australia can access sterile injecting equipment if they need to. And uh, one of part of my role is coordinating teams of outreach workers um, in the southwest region and in the metro area. So we, we cover about six and a half thousand square kilometres of the Greater Perth metropolitan area and about 24,000 square kilometres in the southwest region. Uh, we run a number of other projects from there. We have health clinics co-located with our needle exchanges. Uh, so we have nurse practitioners or a nurse practitioner in Perth and a, a nurse in Bunbury can provide confidential testing for bloodborne viruses and sexually transmitted infections. We can do vaccinations for Hep A and Hep B. Um, we can provide the new treatments for hepatitis C and, and we can provide treatment for most sexually transmitted infections with a fair bit of soft tissue wound management. Our, um, uh, I've mentioned we have the new Hep C treatments available. Um, I'm sure you're aware that the new treatments we have now, the direct antiviral treatments we have, are um, much more, uh, much more better tolerated um, than the old interferon-based treatments. We have that you need to be on them a shorter amount of time. Uh, they have far less side effects. They uh, don't involve any injections. They're just a pill the person takes every day. And uh, they have around 97% chance of clearing the virus. So we are trying to get as many people as we can into treatment. And one of the ways we do that is with a case management service attached to our outreach service. And our nurses are now doing health clinics in outreach settings. They're going to people's homes. Uh, we run peer education programs. The, the largest ones we run are around hepatitis C and getting people into treatment and uh, around preventing opioid overdoses and teaching people how to respond to opioid overdoses as, as first aiders. That includes how to um, administer naloxone. We can provide naloxone for free to people where it's appropriate and uh, you can see a bunch of other services we run there. The vast majority of what we do is in this area that we call harm reduction. Um, harm reduction is quite a politically contentious term. Uh, it shouldn't really be. We all employ harm reduction strategies every day in our lives. And uh, here's an example of one of them. Seatbelts are a harm reduction intervention. We introduced them in Australia because we had an increasing rate of um, mortality and morbidity associated with road trauma. We knew it was unrealistic to try and stop large numbers of the population from driving cars. And we also knew that if there were people driving cars, sometimes they were going to be colliding with each other or with stationary objects. 
We couldn't stop those things happening. We could do things to reduce how often they happened, and that's what a lot of our traffic laws and regulations are about. But we could also do things to increase, to, to decrease the harm uh, when accidents did happen. And that's because we understood Newton's first law, the law of inertia, which basically states that an object that isn't moving won't move unless a force acts on it. And once an object is moving, it'll keep moving in a straight line until a force acts on it. And uh, one of the ways you can get a really good understanding of this law is by doing what the poor person in this picture is doing, uh, which is stopping your car suddenly when you are not restrained. We uh, introduced seatbelts. Uh, Australia was the first place in the world to make them compulsory back in 1970. And uh, after Victoria did it, over the next three years, every other Australian state and territory did it because in that one year where Victoria made seatbelts compulsory, their road toll, road, road toll fell by half. Um, there were just as many people driving just as many cars. There was no reduction in the number of accidents, but half as many people died. And that was just with a belt, uh, a lap belt in the front seat for the driver and the passenger. I'm 53 years old. When I was a kid, kids were totally unrestrained in the cars. We used to ride around in the back of utes and all sorts of things. Just that front seat belt dropped the road toll by 50%. Nowadays, cars are even safer. We have these inertial sash belts you can see in the illustration there. They actually slow you down a bit before they pull tight. Uh, we have collapsible steering columns. We have crumple zones in cars. We have safety glass. And um, we have airbags. And modern cars have uh, collision avoidance systems and all sorts of things. We've made cars so safe now that if you're an adult Australian, you are statistically more likely to die of a drug overdose than you are to die of uh, road trauma. So the point I'm making here is that the incidence and severity of any kind of harm out there in the community can be reduced if we understand the factors that increase or decrease the risk of that harm. This shouldn't be contentious. As I said, it's something we do every day. It becomes contentious when we talk about activities that are illegal or socially disapproved of uh, because people may see this as encouraging the behaviour. Now, um, I just said that seatbelts weren't contentious. They actually were back in 1970. In 1969, when Victoria first started drafting legislation to make seatbelts compulsory, there were a number of people who argued against this legislation. And the arguments they used were that seatbelts would give a false sense of security to people. And they particularly said that younger male drivers were likely to drive more recklessly if they had a seatbelt on. And these people actually predicted that the road toll would increase if we made seatbelts compulsory. That argument sounds very, very silly um, 50 years down the track. But it's exactly the same sort of argument that is regularly used against harm reduction interventions around drugs. Uh, when we first introduced needle and syringe programs in the mid 1950s, all of the naysayers said that the rate of injecting drug use would increase dramatically, that all the young people would start doing it. Uh, that didn't happen. And we have decades worth of international evidence that shows that providing sterile injecting equipment doesn't increase the number of injecting drug users. We have the same sorts of arguments around things like the Medically Supervised Injection Centre in Sydney um, and the new one they've set up in Melbourne. And uh, if you've been following the news in the last couple of years, you will have seen lots of debate around fuel testing at festivals and other events. And again, we hear people saying that if we test the drugs and let people know what's in them, that more people will take drugs. There are countries in the world that have been doing these sorts of things for the last couple of decades. We have a wealth of international evidence that these sorts of interventions um, can reduce harm and that they don't increase the rate of harm and they don't increase the rate of drug use. So uh, harm reduction is just part of our national drug strategy. This was introduced in 1986, harm um, minimization, and it's divided into these three broad arms. We do everything we can to reduce the supply of substances that cause harm. We do everything we can to reduce the demand for those substances, but we accept that we can't possibly prevent all drug use. And we accept 
that if drug use is taking place, there is going to be the potential for drug-related harm. And so that third column there of harm reduction is what we do because demand reduction and supply reduction are not 100% effective. Harm reduction is often represented in the media and in politics as though it's in opposition to the other two arms. Um, I've heard people say things like, why do we give sterile needles to um, drug users? Why don't we just lock up all the drug dealers? Or they say, why do we give uh, methadone to people who are using heroin? Why don't we just get them off drugs? Um, the reason that we don't do that is because for every complex human problem, there's always um, a solution that sounds really simple, and it's intuitively pleasing, and that doesn't actually work. Um, we don't know of any society in the history of um, humanity that has managed to legislate a drug out of existence if there is a big demand for it. And we don't know of any human culture in history or prehistory that hasn't used some sort of psychoactive substances. Um, it's unrealistic to think that we're going to make Australia a drug-free um, culture, but we can do everything we can to reduce the level of drug-related harm, and, and that's what this policy does. It's a very pragmatic policy that attempts to um, attack the problem from every direction. There's some examples here of harm reduction strategies for drug-related harm. Um, I can share the PDFs of these slides with people if they're interested. And all the words you've been seeing on these slides that are in orange and underlined are, are actually hot links. If you click on them, they will take you to a website or a, to a journal article or to some research um, about the subject. So uh, needle and syringe programs, medically supervised injection centres, pill testing at festivals. These are all harm reduction strategies for drug-related harm that are very big in the media and that lots of people will have heard of. Um, less people are probably aware of things like thiamine fortification. Um, Werner Korsakoff syndrome, or Korsakoff syndrome, is a uh, progressive um, illness that affects people's brains. Um, it's caused by thiamine deficiency. It's almost always associated with chronic alcoholism. Um, alcohol reduces your body's ability to uptake B group vitamins. It's a very debilitating um, illness. It progressively destroys people's ability to form new memories, uh, very distressing for the person, and so the longer that it progresses, and it is eventually fatal. In 1991, our federal government legislated to put thiamine in all bread products, and our rate of WK, WKS fell dramatically. That's a wonderful harm reduction um, success story. That's a little known. We knew we couldn't stop everyone from drinking alcohol, and we knew that some of those people were going to drink to excess. And um, so we just did something to try and prevent one of the adverse effects that was happening there. There's a few other examples of these sorts of programs there. We're going to be talking about drug dependency um, for the rest of this session. And um, drug Dependency is an area which uh, has a lot of discrimination, a lot of prejudice attached to it. I will want to talk about that very briefly. According to the World Health Organization, people who are dependent on drugs are the single most stigmatized population group on the planet. I'm not sure if that surprises anyone listening. The words that we use are quite important. The, the words we use um, shape the way that we think about things, and the way that we think about things changes the way that we act about things. More importantly, the, the words that we use have an effect on the people who hear them. So here's a word I, I'm not that keen on. Um, this, is, um, this is a photo of branding iron. But uh, this is not um, this is not a branding iron for um, for branding cattle with. This is a branding iron for branding people with. So in the 1600s um, in Europe, a lot of countries 
would deliberately disfigure someone who was convicted of a um, a criminal or religious offence. I don't know if any of you have seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, but if you have, you may have noticed that Captain Jack has a P branded on his right hand. And that's something the British government would have done to him so that whenever he shook hands with anyone, um, they would know that he'd been convicted of piracy. This is the brand we used to use for people who were convicted of adultery. Now, the reason that I don't like the word stigma is because it literally means a mark that you place on someone that permanently identifies them as deviant or bad, as socially or morally deviant. So when I'm talking about um, stigma around drug and alcohol use, I actually prefer to use words like discrimination or prejudice because that puts the problem where the problem really is. Now, the problem isn't in the person who's being subjected to the stigmatizing attitudes. The problem is in the person who has the stigmatizing attitude. People who use drugs frequently experience discrimination in healthcare settings. Um, it's just the normal for them. And preconceptions on the part of medical professionals can have a very real impact on how people are assessed and how or whether they are treated. I can give you a brief couple of brief examples of that. Um, a number of years ago, there was um, an Aboriginal woman from the Central Desert staying at Wellington Square in Perth. It's a park near Royal Perth Hospital that people often sleep rough in. Um, it's a kind of meeting place for people from out of country. And um, while she was there, she went to Royal Perth Hospital and asked the staff in the emergency department for a fit pack. Um, um, those of you in rural and regional areas probably know that uh, uh, public hospitals provide needle and syringe programs in those areas. But they don't do that in the Perth metropolitan area. The staff in the hospital um, let this woman know that um, they couldn't provide her with needles and syringes. A few days later, she presented to the hospital again. Uh, she was behaving as though she was unwell. She was wailing and carrying on, making quite a bit of noise. Some of the staff in the hospital recognised her from her previous visit and they assumed she was drug affected and I think they also decided that she was a time waster um, because they left her waiting in in the waiting room without um, being assessed. And um, I think they were just hoping she'd go away. She didn't go away, she lay down on the floor to have a little nap and one of the security guards um, went to tell her that she wasn't allowed to sleep on the floor and discovered that she was unresponsive because this woman wasn't drug affected, she'd actually been struck over the back of the head and she was bleeding into cranially. And she may very well have died on, in the triage room of um, one of our most busy emergency departments if the security guard hadn't tried to wake her up. That's a pretty spectacular example of um, inadequate assessment. Um, but um, there, we, we encounter this sort of thing very regularly. Um, People who are, have serious injuries, who are treated as though they are drug seeking when they present in an emergency department, uh, sometimes multiple internal injuries. Um, most drug users don't think of an emergency department as somewhere to go to seek drugs. They're so accustomed to being uh, treated in a discriminatory fashion in healthcare settings that it's the last place they want to go. They tend to turn up in emergency departments when they're extremely unwell and they don't have anywhere else to go. Experiencing um, judgmental treatment or inequitable treatment actively deters people from seeking help in a timely fashion. It means they tend to try and ignore or put up with um, problems and let them progress. Sometimes problems that would be very simple to deal with if they presented to a health professional early, of course.
the link at the bottom of this screen is to a very large meta-study that was conducted by Canadian researchers about two years ago. Um, and in this study, they wanted to identify what the um, risk factors were for someone progressing to substance dependence. You know, there's a big difference between someone taking a drug and someone progressing to problematic and dependent patterns of use. And we know that there are social and economic factors. Um, we know that there are um, social and economic influences on people's health, and this applies to their mental health and their drug use as well. This study, this meta study, found that the single strongest predictor of substance dependence was the experience experience of discrimination. So think about the self fulfilling prophecy, the, the self-reinforcing spiral we are setting up when we stigmatise people for being dependent on drugs. Drug users end up internalising these sorts of attitudes. They end up thinking that they don't deserve any better. This is another word that I'd be quite happy if people stopped using, the word addict. I'm not alone in that. I think it was about 1964 when the World Health Organization um, first suggested that doctors shouldn't call their patients addicts. Um, in my work, I might say that someone is experiencing drug dependency. I, I might say they're physiologically dependent. I might say that they are using in a problematic fashion, um, that they're using in problematic patterns. I might say that they're, they're displaying addictive patterns of behavior. But I would never say that they were an addict. And um, in, in German, the word for someone who's dependent on opioids is morphium sucker. And uh, morphium just means morphine. And sucken is a German verb which means to seek or to look for something. So morphium sucker just means morphine seeking. Or if you literally translate it, it means morphine seeky. I like that word, morphine seeky. Uh, I like it partly because it sounds kind of cool and weird, but I, I mostly like it because it's a bit like a roof that's leaky. You know, a leaky roof isn't leaking all the time. It just has the potential to leak. And I like it most of all because it's an adjective. It, it modifies my understanding of the person. It's not a noun that defines the person. There's some further reading there if you would like to get these PDFs and have a look at this link. Um, so I, I would encourage you to think very carefully about how you present to people who, who come to you having problems with drugs. Um, think about um, how your language, how your behaviour impacts on them. One of the links to further reading there is from the Australian Injecting and Illicit Drug Users League. They did a bunch of research around this issue quite a few years ago. They found that medical professionals um, were the profession that showed the highest level of discrimination um, towards people who use drugs. And the very interesting thing is that when they spoke to some of the doctors who had um, stigmatising attitudes, they found that most of the doctors were well aware of this and they actually thought that their behaviour was good for their patients. They said things that made it really obvious that they thought that if they if they demonstrated their disapproval of the drug use, that the patient would stop using drugs. Because we always do exactly what our doctor tells us to, don't we? Um, so I guess what I want you to think about is the fact that, you know, that doesn't actually get your patient to stop using drugs. It just convinces your patient to stop being completely honest with you about what they're doing if they feel judged. So the World Health Organization says drug dependence is um, the single most um, stigmatized um, behavior in the world. Let's talk a bit about what drug dependence is and isn't, and what addiction is and isn't, because they are different things. I'm going to be talking through um, examples related to the drug methamphetamine, uh, the crystalline form of its media called ice. But the general principles I'm talking about apply to any um, any class of psychoactive drug, any class of dependence forming. So 
substance. So when someone takes the methamphetamine, it engages with um, receptors and with reuptake pumps in your brain. And the way it does that increases the amount of dopamine, noradrenaline and serotonin that's available in the central nervous system. So this, um, this is what accounts for the effects the drug has. And when you take the drug, it elevates the levels of these chemicals for a period of time and then they wear off. So if we look at this graph, if we imagine um, that it has a scale going up and down, and then it has a axis going across sideways, which is time. If someone takes some methamphetamine, the levels of dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline in their brain are going to increase, and then they're going to decrease. And, and typically, they're going to drop below normal because the drug has encouraged your nervous system to release a lot more of these chemicals than it normally would. And because while you're under the influence of the drug, um, it represses your appetite, you're probably not eating much. It uh, definitely encourages activity. It makes you want to run around and do fun things. And uh, it, um, it greatly reduces your need or your desire for sleep as well. So when the drug wears off, you're going to have a little bit of a dip or a crash. What does this look like? Well. Um, the effect of those chemicals together, um, it makes you more confident, it makes you more talkative, it gives you more energy and enthusiasm. It does tend to make people feel sexy, um, it increases their stamina. People tend to be a bit more impulsive. They're more likely to do things that they might not do. Um, they're more likely to act out a bit. It does sometimes encourage really focused, repetitive behavior. Um, there are physical signs you can see in someone who's um, intoxicated with methamphetamine. And the biggest one in that list there really is large pupils. If someone's had a, a big enough dose to really affect their behavior, it will make their pupils of their eyes dilate. Um, none of these signs that I'm listing here are evidence that the person is on meth or on ice. But if there's other reasons to suspect they are and you see some of these things, um, then, it's, then that's evidence that might confirm your suspicion. If you take too much meth, then um, less pleasant things begin to happen. So we can have problems with physical toxicity. Um, quite often when people have taken a dose of meth that's, that's a bit too big for their body to handle, the first thing that you'll see is um, nausea and possibly vomiting or dry retching. Uh, that can actually be life-threatening if it goes on for too long. People can get dangerously dehydrated that way. And if they're dry retching convulsively, they're not going to be able to rehydrate themselves orally. They're actually going to need medical attention. Um, the increase in adrenaline um, is going to uh, increase your blood pressure and your pulse rate. At the same time, serotonin um, vasoconstricts some of the smaller blood vessels. So you can have problems like stroke or, or cardiac problems coming from too much meth. The most common problems we see with people taking too much meth though are the behavioral problems uh, and uh, the most famously sort of drug-induced episodes of psychosis. These are all kind of exaggerations of the desired effect of the drug. So to most people who don't use methamphetamine, the thing we're most worried about are these um, behavioural issues when someone is very, very heavily intoxicated. But these sorts of behaviours are actually very rare amongst people who use meth. In Australia in the last 12 months, um, more than 45% of people who used meth used it once or twice. So the vast majority of people who take this drug in Australia are not dependent drug users. They're not the ice addicts we see in the headline. They're actually people who take this drug very occasionally um, and recreationally. And they don't tend to, what they're looking for are these sorts of things, not these sorts of things. And that up bit is the bit that they identify as good. People who use the drug regularly even, um, don't. the majority of them don't have problems with psychosis. Um, so this, this upswing 
is what they see as the good part of the drug use. The crash afterwards is the bit that they identify as the problem because it's basically the opposite feeling of being high. Uh, you have no energy, you have no enthusiasm, uh, you feel depressed, uh, life is not rewarding, everything feels kind of flat and colourless and, and lifeless and everything feels hard. When people use the drug once every six months, like 45% of meth users in Australia do, um, they're going to have a, assuming they avoid all of these nasty things here, assuming they take a dose that their body can tolerate, they're probably going to have a, a night or a day um, that they quite enjoy, and then they're going to have uh, 12 hours to a day where they're feeling a bit lazy and relaxing and recovering. But if we start doing this more regularly, um, we start to see quite a dramatic decline. So the more often someone uses meth, the more likely they are to start having these sorts of problems. And what we often see is this sort of pattern called a run, crash, run cycle, which is where the person uses the drug, they run around for a day or two feeling good, uh, the drug wears off and they crash for a bit, and then they just redose with the drug. If you're doing this very regularly, your body and your brain don't get enough time to recharge. And uh, we see the effects as the person um, starts to develop a tolerance to the drug. So if someone uses the drug very occasionally, they experience a crash after an episode of use. If someone's using the drug more regularly, their nervous system begins to adapt to the presence of the drug. And the, the, if your levels of dopamine, serotonin and noradrenaline are, are always elevated or always out of sync, um, your nervous system doesn't know what methamphetamine is. It just that there's something wrong with the way it's regulating these neurotransmitters. And it, um, it tries to fix the problem. And the way it does that is by down-regulating how much of these chemicals it releases naturally because you keep artificially elevating them with the drug. And it makes the receptors for these chemicals less sensitive. And on this graph, that's kind of like we're moving that, that neutral zero line down a bit. Okay, that we've just reset normal. And what this means is when the person is using the drug very regularly, if they're using it once or twice a week or more often than that, when they're not on the drug, they don't feel normal. Um, everything's down. And taking a dose of the drug that used to ping them way up to here now just bumps them up to feeling a bit better than normal. They need a little bit of their drug in their system um, just to function normally. And so this is um, the first sign that someone's developing a dependence is first of all, they start reporting a tolerance. It takes more of the drug than it used to to get to the same place. And the flip side of having a, um, a tolerance is dependence and withdrawal. When the drug isn't in their system, they don't feel normal and they feel an urge to take the drug to bump them back up to where normal is or where it used to be. And um, these are the main mental health problems that we actually see associated with methamphetamine dependence. Okay, psychosis is the one that gets in the media. It's definitely a very real problem, but the majority of people who use meth regularly actually have a lot more problems um, with anxiety, with depression, um, with social withdrawal, um, with anhedonia and dysthemia. So the media attention is very firmly focused on psychosis, but the most prevalent problem amongst people who use methamphetamine chronically um, are to do with mood control and depression and anxiety, uh, problems with concentration and memory. When someone is dysthemic, it means they don't have any energy or enthusiasm. When they're anhedonic, it means little things in life that should make you feel good don't. Everything just feels kind of flat and colourless and lifeless and boring. And as you can imagine, this is one of the things that makes relapse in methamphetamine dependence quite common. Um, it's very hard for someone who's experiencing these sorts of symptoms for long periods of time to resist the temptation to go and use occasionally when they know it's going to make them feel fantastic for a day or two. The other thing that's going on is um, when you use any drug regularly, your conditioning responses, which um, in, in drug and alcohol treatment we call cues to relapse. But it's exactly the same sort of process as you would see 
uh, with Pavlovian conditioning. So uh, I'm sure you've all heard of Pavlov, the Russian scientist who um, he taught dogs to drool um, by when they when he rang a bell. Very simple, put a ring a bell and put some meat in front of the dog. And if you do that repeatedly for a couple of weeks or so, um, you don't need the meat anymore. Whenever you ring the bell, you've formed an association in the dog's brain between the bell and food, and the dog will start salivating, anticipating that food. People aren't dogs, but the way that our brains learn behaviours is very similar. We associate certain things with other things. When we learn anything new, we are burning new connections between brain cells. We are hardwiring that in. So we're not talking about people's willpower here. We're talking about physiological adaptions to cues in their environment. And so an example of that for someone who's used injecting drugs, for instance, uh, a lot of people who have a history of injecting drug use are very uncomfortable when they see imagery involving needles, especially needles with blood in them, uh, syringes with blood in them. Way down deep in their brain, there's an association that means whenever they see that, um, their brain chemistry is about to change. So when the government puts ads on TV that are, show people injecting in toilets or in alleyways that are meant to discourage people from using drugs, um, it actually makes a lot of people who have a history of injecting drugs um, very uncomfortable and makes some of them want to go and uh, and use because it's triggering these old cues. Fortunately, our brains are incredibly neuroplastic. Our, our brains are adaptive, responsive organs. You know, when our brain, when people become physiologically dependent on a drug, it's their nervous system adapting to the drug being there all the time. If the drug isn't there all the time for long enough, their nervous system will adapt to it not being there. If someone's taken week, uh, months or years um, to build up a drug habit to, to teach their nervous system to expect the drug all, all the time, then um, it's going to take weeks or months at least for them to unlearn that. And that, that process is, is what we call um, rehabilitation and recovery. The, um, the last point to make here is that these Pavlovian responses, these conditioned responses, um, they can definitely act as triggers to relapse. And so I'll give you some examples of that very quickly. If, if someone always uses a particular drug in certain situations, if they always use it to cope with certain social pressures, um, if they use it in certain environments or with certain people, there will be connections formed in their brain between those things and the drug. And one of the ways that our body prompts us to use when we are um, in withdrawal like this is by learning how to drop these, these, um, drug these neurotransmitter levels very rapidly in response to cues in the environment. If every time I see a syringe um, with blood in it, my brain is filled with meth, my brain actually learns to preempt the effects of the meth as soon as it sees the syringe with blood in it. It'll start dropping those neurotransmitter levels very quickly to try and compensate for what's about to hit it. These, uh, that's a very clever piece of adaption on the part of my brain, but it can cause all sorts of problems if I'm trying not to use. If I always use with a certain person, I might remain abstinent quite happily for a while, but the first time I meet up with that person, I'm probably going to feel some of these triggers. If I use drugs to cope with emotional or social problems, um, then I'm probably going to find when I'm in the situations where I used to use drugs to cope for that, that I'm going to feel an urge to do it again. The good news, as I said, is that our brains are incredibly neuroplastic. They're adaptable. They, they change. And um, the longer someone goes without using the drug, the less compelling and the less frequent these sorts of cues become. You know, the more often those old um, ground in ruts are triggered, um, the less likely they are um, to be acted on in future. So when we talk about methamphetamine use, um, we can say that if someone uses very regularly, it's actually having an effect on their brain chemistry. That's the you know, adaption. Long-term use of high doses of methamphetamine can also cause some axonal pruning. That's um, 
cutting of connections between brain cells. So that's kind of really damage to the structure of the brain, although um, you could claim it was an adaption as well. You know, if a, a dopamine being bearing car players being overstimulated regularly, your nervous system just trims it off. Withdrawal symptoms can last for two or three months. Um, it can take a while for people's brain chemistry to get back to normal. Urges to relapse related to condition cues, well, they can re reoccur for months and sometimes people report years after they stopped using, suddenly finding themselves in a situation that sends them right back into that state again. Um, these can persist for a long time, those condition cues. As I said, they're hardwired into your brain. But I guess um, the more things people have going on in their life that aren't about drug use as they recover, um, the less compelling those cues are going to be. And we think that axonal pruning, when it occurs, can, can um, cause problems for up to nine months, maybe even a bit longer. Withdrawal symptoms involve all of these sorts of um, symptoms, which I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, withdrawal symptoms from other types of drugs are different, but again, we have the, the same issue of the person doesn't feel right all the time and way down deep in the back of their brain somewhere, they know there's a very easy way for everything to feel good again. And that's just to go back to use the drug again. People need support while they're going through this process, while their nervous system is learning how to negotiate things without the drug being there anymore. This is from some of uh, Nicole Lee's research <clears throat> showing just how long those methamphetamine withdrawal symptoms can be. But I guess the good thing about this graph is it shows that Within the first couple of weeks, you've usually seen the most serious symptoms taper off. If you can get the person through the first couple of weeks, you just have to remember that they need support ongoing into the future as they, as they try and rebuild. So I'm going to stop in a moment and just see if there's any questions. So my, my very last points would just be about the fact that if you're a doctor or a nurse or a health worker, particularly if you're a remote area or if you're working in the region somewhere, um, you're actually in a really good position to effectively deliver harm reduction interventions for people who are using drugs if you know how to engage with them effectively. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, the one thing you want to do is appear to be non judgmental. Drug users are really accustomed to encountering prejudice and discrimination in healthcare settings. People will routinely not disclose their drug use or they will they will try to underplay it. I had to have emergency surgery last year and at the time I was drinking about three or four glasses of wine every night, um, which I've since uh, cut back on. But when I was admitted, you know, they they do an assessment and they asked me how many glasses of wine, uh, they asked me how much alcohol I drank and I said, oh, it's a typical night, I drink three glasses of wine. They immediately, um, started trying to work out whether they needed benzos to manage my withdrawals. And I realized that they were just assuming that I was under-reporting my alcohol consumption and uh, probably doubling what I'd said by two or three. So um, if people do that with legal substances like alcohol, imagine how much stronger the urge is to, to not mention it when it's something as socially disapproved of as heroin or right. Don't be judgmental. Try and express genuine empathy and care. And most of all, listen to the person. Um, if you listen to your drug using patients, you're probably going to learn a lot. But try not to have an agenda. Um, pe people who use drugs are quite used to, uh, when they disclose their drug use, people immediately start talking to them about how they can stop, about how they can get support, about rehab, and so on. Um, they're probably sick of people tell trying to tell them those things. What they really want is someone to listen to what problems they're identifying and maybe help them with those. It doesn't matter if you don't get a lot done with the person the first time you engage with them, if they feel that they were listened to and treated with respect, because they're almost certainly gonna come back to you if you're the one doctor or nurse who's ever done that for them. You want what you're doing to be perceived as useful to the patient. It has to be relevant, it has to be timely. Um, it needs to be tailored to the individual presentation. We definitely don't have a one size fits all solution for drug and alcohol problems. If the person is, see, is talking about getting treatment, there are places you can refer them to. But if they're not talking about getting treatment, you need to recognise that and not try and railroad them 
in a direction that they're not talking about going in. And uh, there are some quite useful links here for people seeking treatment, for support or advice, and uh, for parent, parents or family members or significant others who are, are trying to support someone through this sort of thing. My contact details are on the screen now. You're most welcome to copy these down if I can be useful. And I think we have about 10 minutes left if um, anyone has any questions. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think that worked really well and was so informative. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the question box. I can't see that any coming through at the moment. Um, so just as a reminder to everybody, you should see the question on your dashboard. Um, oh, here we go. We've just got one through. Um, Paul, I'm not too sure if you can see the question box, so I'll just read it out to you if that's okay. Sure. Um, so one of our participants has asked, with the curve coming down, can you please explain about tolerance and dependence? Sure. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, it's a bit weird doing this without being able to see people. <laughs> um, <laughs> when when someone is um, has become physiologically dependent on a drug, what's happening is that their nervous system is adapting to the drug being there all the time. So if you are using methamphetamine, as I said, um, it's it's elevating levels of those neurotransmitters, um, serotonin, dopamine, and, and noradrenaline. If you are using heroin or morphine or oxycodone or other opioid drugs, you're using codeine, um, your, the, the levels of encaphalins and endorphins, the, the endogenous opioids that naturally occur in your nervous system, are being artificially elevated by that drug. Um, and any class of drug you can think of, um, the, the reason that it has the effect it has on us is because the molecule of the drug just happens to be a similar shape to chemicals that occur naturally in our nervous system. So um, can, cannabis, can, cannabis smoke contains THC and CBD, and there are receptors in our brains, which we call the cannabinoid receptors. They're not there to have chemicals from cannabis smoke engage with them. They're there to have what we call endocannabinoids. Um, naturally occurring chemicals in our nervous system engage with. So drugs just happen to fit into these different structures and that means they can kind of um, hijack the, um, the structures that, that um, are the basis of our, our neurochemistry. Um, your brain is a responsive adaptive organ. It, its job is to build itself, to fit the environment it's in. You know, when, when you were born, your you, um, your brain, um, between when you were born and when you were two years old, your brain doubled in size. But between when you were born and about 12 years old, your brain quadrupled in size. Uh, but you didn't grow lots more brain cells. You have roughly the same number of brain cells now as you did when you were born. Uh, what you've grown is all these connections between them. And uh, anything you learn, is forging all these new connections between brain cells and, and drug use is the same. So we have two things going on here and, and one is that our nervous system is changing the way it regulates its chemicals um, to try and adapt to the fact that the drug is always there and the other one is that our brain is learning uh, to connect things in our environment with the drug use and these two things together are what lead to people falling into patterns of dependent use. Um, is that um, there? So the I'm, I'm not sure how clearly I'm explaining this without having the um, without being able to point to my slide. <laughs> so if we imagine, can everyone see that? Or Beth, do you know if people can yeah. see the slide I put up? Yep, so everyone if we imagine, should be able to see that. that. That line across the middle, that zero, if we imagine that's normal, that's our normal level of arousal if we're awake. When we take the drug, it's pushing us up above that level. And then when the drug wears off, um, we're dropping down below that normal level. 
as your brain adapts to the drug being there regularly, it does it by reducing the amount of those chemicals it releases naturally. And it makes the, it makes the receptors that those chemicals engage with less and less sensitive. And those receptors are also what the drug methamphetamine engages with. So that's why someone gets a tolerance. It's, it's because their nervous system is adapting to the constant presence of the drug. And it's not doing it because it knows what meth is. It's doing it because it thinks that there's something wrong with the way those three chemicals are being regulated. So it's trying to it's trying to calm things down, and that's why we represent it like this. Like that zero line has moved down. That's the that's the new normal level, and the blue line is what happens when we take the drug. Um, before we've adapted to it, it pumps us right up. But once we've adapted to it, the same dose just makes us feel a little bit better than normal. And we're going to have to take a bigger dose. We're going to have to take almost twice as much in this example to get up as high as we were before. I hope that's kind of explained um, what that person was asking. Um, Paul, so we've got another question here. Any recommendations for GP registrars wanting to upskill further in AOD from a practical point of view? I've been working as a junior in ED and psychiatry boards a fair bit lately and have learnt a lot about the medical side of things, but realised that I come from a very sheltered background and want to become an accessible and useful GP for my patients. Wow. And, um, and sorry, um, there is, um, just, just, just to jump in again, there is an, an addition to that question, um, especially when journeying with patients over the long term that is beyond that initial intoxication withdrawal presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, would, I would probably try talking to um, some of the clinicians uh, from Next Step, uh, from Community Alcohol and Drug Services. So whatever region you are in, I would try and get in touch with your local Community Alcohol and Drug Service if you're not already in touch with them. And um, my, my details are up on the screen right now. You're most welcome to, send, whoever asked that question, you're most welcome to send me an email and um, I can have a look around for any online training and stuff that might be appropriate. If you send me an email, I'll be able to work out more specifically what you're looking for. And I might also be able to introduce you to some people in your region who could be helpful. Thanks, Paul. And another participant has commented that there is um, an essential skills course available online, um, which is a two hour course. So we can probably make that um, the details of that course available to the participants too. Yep. The Mental Health Commission also runs training quite regularly. I'm just not sure um, what level it's at. Can, uh, yeah. But if, if anyone wants to email me, it would be much easier to make recommendations if I know more about exactly what they're looking for and and um, and, and what area they're in. All right, thank you. That is almost um, um, bang on the hour now. So just thank you for everybody who has joined us on the um, the session for this recording this afternoon. And um, I would like to say thank you to Paul for his time and for being part of the Rural Health Research Conference. And um, Paul, I know that you can't see everybody, but we do have a couple of comments coming through saying um, thank you, um, much appreciated, great session. So there's the um, some feedback for you. Um, so everybody, I will now, yeah, I'll now close the webinar and um, look forward to everybody hopefully joining us on our next webinar. Thanks again. Thanks, Beth.